So one thing that I've been learning about myself recently is that sometimes when I think I'm making the worst possible decision, like horrific, it's going to have terrible results, I'm actually making the best possible decision. And that sounds contradictory, and it is. But I don't know if you guys have ever had this happen, but you know, often when I'm on the cusp of doing something really awesome, maybe risky, but that has the potential for amazing experiences and tremendous payoff, my gut feeling says, don't do it. You're going to be out of your comfort zone. It will be weird. And then my brain takes me on this tour of like all the catastrophes that could happen if I decide to proceed with the opportunity. So like the plane will crash. You won't have hair product if you're in the north for a month, you know, alone in the Northwest Territories. Maybe a bear will eat you. And so where I've had to get to is understanding that, you know, all of that gut feeling of negativity is really just the toll that I have to pay if I want to cross the border out of my comfort zone and do really neat things beyond that sphere of comfort. That's where growth and learning happens. And so I was watching a TED talk the other day actually and the speaker said basically that it's, it's important in life to, it's more important to seek meaning in your life, to do things that are meaningful to you, than it is to avoid discomfort. So that's what I think every time my gut feeling is like, don't do it. I think, no, I'm going to do it. I'm going to push through and it will be really awesome. So the last time I felt like this was this past summer when I had the opportunity to spend a month in the Northwest Territories. And this opportunity was provided to me by Trent University. I'm very grateful to them. They offered a month-long field course and it was an interdisciplinary look at the North. And so part of it was going to be living on the land with Dene elders. Part of it would be spending time in Yellowknife and talking to politicians. And, you know, when I saw it, my gut feeling said, don't do it. And then I thought, no, you know, I have a responsibility to go. I've, I've spent a lot of time studying Aboriginal communities in Canada, but I've never actually been. And so to keep speaking with authority on something that I don't actually know firsthand is problematic to me. So I decided to go on this trip. And what I have to talk to you about today are three sort of pivotal moments when I was forced to think outside the box or to consider a totally new perspective on things. So I'll be discussing those in a moment. Before I get to that, it's always really important to me when I'm talking about Aboriginal communities and Aboriginal people, just to, to put a bit of a disclaimer at the front of it and just say, you know, there's a storied history of Aboriginal people being spoken for. And I'm not here to do that today. Everything I discuss is my own experience. Probably not all of it is 100% factually correct because it's just what I observed. And maybe someone from a Dene community would explain it differently. So you should keep that in mind as I'm talking today. What I am going to do is just offer you a small slice of the really transformative experience that I got to have in the North this summer. So the first kind of pivotal moment um, was when you know, we arrived in, in Edmonton, we flew to Edmonton, this small group, and we drove up through Alberta all the way up to the Northwest Territories, and we traveled around when we were there. So I spent time in the south of the Northwest Territories with the Slavey, that's the group of Aboriginal people that live in the south, and then we went up to Fort Providence, which is kind of in the middle, and then we went up all the way to Yellowknife and Bechico, and then eventually to a fly-in community, which was an hour north of Yellowknife beyond that. So only accessible by plane in the summer and they have an ice road in the winter, which is kind of neat. Um, yeah, so we arrived and, and we got there and my instructor has spent a lot of time in Yellowknife, so she was kind of trying to situate some things for us, but this didn't really hit home for me until I was up in this fish camp, um, which was just on this creek right here. And you'll see that there's kind of a little cottage and then the, the sandbar. And on the other side of that is Great Slave Lake. So we were really close to just this gorgeous vista of water. And we were there and an elder said, you know, it's important to pay the land. What is paying the land? You know, I pay my bills, but that's all I know how to do. And um, the elder explained, okay, well, this is, this is how you pay the land. This is what happens. So the process of paying the land is something that the Dene practice all over the Northwest Territories. The process of expressing gratitude and appreciation to the environment. And it's something that's totally different than what we know in the South, where we, I think more and more we think about, you know, how do I manipulate my environment to suit me? How do I use raw materials to make something else? How do I build a bigger house? How do I blow up that rock so that my mansion will fit in that spot, you know, on, on this property that I've purchased? We think way more about manipulating. But what I observed in the Stedding community was that you know, it was way more about interacting with your environment in a respectful way. And, and one of the ways of respecting the land is to pay it. So I'm going to teach you all how to pay the land. 
You pick something that is important to you. The jury's out on what that might be. For some people, it's tobacco, because that has spiritual significance in Aboriginal communities. And for some people, it's money. As a Southerner, I was told that money's really important to us, and so the act of having to give it up, is there's real sacrifice there. So paying with money sometimes is allowed. But other people said to me, you know what, you can pay with anything that's important to you. So some of the coffee drinkers on the trip paid with coffee in the morning. I really liked eating peaches when I was up there. We didn't have a lot of fresh fruit, so I paid with fruit sometimes. But you take something that's of meaning, and, and you go into a quiet place, preferably in the woods, because you're not supposed to let anyone else see you doing this. You just have a quiet moment, and you, you thank the land for, for where you are currently. If you had to travel to get there, maybe you thank the land for safe travels. You thank them for good weather. And then there's an opportunity to ask for what you need next. And so you might say, I need to catch a lot of fish because we're having people over for dinner. Or I really need there to be sun because we're going to be driving three hours tomorrow and I don't want to be caught in a rainstorm. So you ask for what you need as well. You take whatever is important to you and you place it on the ground. And you don't dig a hole and bury it, but you just kind of obscure it so that if someone was walking by, they wouldn't see it and know what it was. And you just thank the land. In your head, you don't speak out loud. It's very quiet. It's almost like a form of prayer. And so it was very foreign to me as someone from the South where, you know, we've never done this. I try to respect my environment. I like to be outside. I've never paid the land. And it felt kind of hokey, to be, to be frank with you, you know, as someone who was like, what will paying the land do? But then we did have times when we were up there, you know, when we hadn't seen any bison one day. We really wanted to see bison, so we paid the land, and then we were in a traffic jam of bison you know, on this empty highway, but there must have been like 300 of them just right there in front of our car. Or we were in the middle of a rainstorm, and we thought, well, this is inconvenient. We're supposed to eat lunch. Paid the land. The sun came out. So I'm not saying it's true or false, but it just was an interesting way of thinking about your environment and bringing gratitude into everything you do. And I just thought it was such a nice paradigm shift from what happens in the South, you know, where we might just be frustrated by the rain and instead of thinking of a way to situate it positively. And when you're in vistas like this, where you know, we had just hiked a mountain basically vertically for three hours in, in really, really hot sun, when you're that connected to place, it feels nice to pay the land. So we really got into the habit of doing it. And the whole time we were up there, the whole group was paying, and the elders were really pleased that we were doing this. You can also pay the water if you want you know, good, to get good fish or to have a smooth boat ride. So yeah, just this idea of paying the land. And what really struck me was when we drove back through Alberta on our way to Edmonton to catch our flights home, you know, we're driving through tar sand country and oil sand country, and it's an extraction zone, and it's really important economically. I definitely see the benefits of that, but you know, it, it does, there are environmental repercussions as well. And so it was just really polarizing and different to spend time in this stunningly beautiful place where you were paying the land and always thinking about that reciprocal relationship, and then to c drive through and see these fields of what are probably genetically modified crops you know, with an oil rig in the middle to extract oil. And you just thought, how do we repay that? Like, can you pay back the land enough for what we're doing there? And I think the answer is you probably can't. So it was just something interesting to think about. It was my first instance of thinking outside the box. This is me plucking a duck at the side of a lake. We had just shot the duck. It was still warm. It's actually very pleasant to pluck, which I didn't know because the feathers are soft and your hands stay hot. <laughs> Um, so we ate a lot of traditional food when we were up there. And what was interesting to me was that, you know, as a woman and as a feminist, I was raised by a mother who considers herself a feminist. Most of my girlfriends are feminist. You know, we think about women getting to do everything men can do and, and this concept of equality. And we criticize cultures where that's not allowed and where women are oppressed and, and rightly so. But when we were in the North, I was exposed to this very different way of thinking about women and the strength of women. And I've, I've reflected on it a lot, um, having come back from it, I think. Because, you know, when I get up there, the elders said to me, the female elders said to me, you know, women have the capacity to give life. They're very, very powerful. And because of that power, sometimes you have to restrict your behavior so that you don't remove the power of men or others, and specifically hunters. Um, you know, if, if you're in your moon cycle, which Someone asked me when my moon cycle was, and I was like, pardon? I don't, like, I haven't talked about that in a super long time. Um, so, you know, 
I don't know what it is. I'll have to think about it. Um, but they said, you know, when that's happening, you're so powerful, and so there are rules. You aren't allowed to step over blood. If there's blood in the boat from shooting a duck, you're not allowed to step over something that we've killed to eat, that we've harvested to eat. Uh, there are rules in the winter, too. If you're walking on a path and there's a male hunter on a path because they'll clear the snow, you're not supposed to walk behind the hunter because you could remove his power. So it was different to me to think, okay, I'm a woman in this culture now and I'm limited by some of the cultural norms, but it's not out of a desire to oppress me. It's sort of like out of respect for my ability to have a kid, which I forgot I even had. So I just thought it was an interesting contrast. And all the girls in the group really struggled with this because we're used to just being able to do whatever we want in an unrestricted way. And so it was neat to kind of have that contrasting, you know, there are limitations because you're a woman and you're powerful. So just a very different conception of feminism there. The third time that I really was forced to think in a, in a completely different way was when we were speaking with the chief of one of the neighboring bands and one thing that we'd been noticing the whole time we were in the North was that many people practice Catholicism and Christianity and are religious, and actively so. And they'll wear religious insignia and they'll talk about it openly. And, you know, our group just thought, well, this is interesting because there's a history of residential schools in Canada and most of those were run by churches. And for better or for worse, you know, there were some very negative outcomes for Aboriginal communities in that process. And so when you think about the cultural devastation that happened, some you know, history of abuse in some cases, you would assume that you know, whoever had experienced that would reject all those religious institutions as a given because they'd had such mostly negative experiences when they were there. Not everybody had a terrible time, but many people did. And so we were really puzzled by this because we'd enter these communities where there'd be a big church and people would be, you know, kind of intersecting this traditional spirituality with a more, where something I was more used to, which was kind of a Christian, biblical attitude. And finally, we worked up the courage to ask this one chief, you know, how are you still religious and practicing religion when this is your history? And he just looked at us, and you could tell that he, he was just like incredulous. Why would we have asked that question? And he said, oh, well, that's easy. He said, it's because Jesus is all about love and religion is all about love, and that's what our culture is about. It's about appreciating other people, you know, expressing gratitude, being very generous, giving everything of yourself to others, and really looking out for other people. And so he said, of course, why would we not practice this religion? It aligns with everything that we fundamentally believe. Like, at its core, those two belief sets are the same. And I just thought, oh my gosh, you know, if everyone in the world had the capacity to take that kind of experience, and instead of building on that hate and building on that suffering and move past that and instead choose to see the positive in it, we would live in a much better world. And so it was just this really profound moment, I think, of reflecting on how this group of people who meet struggles every day and who have met tremendous struggle in the past, and those impacts are still being felt, have the ability to kind of condense everything down to its root and just really say, like, what's happening here. Like, we love other people, and it's as simple as that. Thank you.